Okay, welcome to our program. Before we get our program started this evening, I wanted to let you know that we are recording this to enable people who are not able to log in right now to be able to see it at their convenience. So if you do not want to be included in that video footage, you can just turn off your camera and then you won't be included in the recording. I have also turned on the closed captioning. So if you would like to see a transcript of the conversation, you can, uh, you should be able to enable it at some place on your screen, either with the CC button, if that shows up, or maybe it's under the more tab, but you should be able to turn on or turn off the closed captioning to meet your preferences. And finally, my last announcement, I wanna let you know about some of our other upcoming programs. And as I normally do, I put up this slide. So uh, this coming Tuesday, as part of our David Taub Real Upstander film series, we'll be screening the PBS documentary entitled America and the Holocaust, Deceit and Indifference. The film describes some of the bureaucratic hurdles that were put up in the 1930s to reduce the number of German refugees who were let into America. And after the screening, we'll be joined by Christopher Boyan from the Office of the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, the UN Refugee Agency, that was established in the wake of the Holocaust. And he's gonna help to connect the history to more contemporary refugee issue, issues. So I hope you'll join us for that program. Then on Wednesday, I'll be back for my next Curator's Corner program to talk about a photo of the opening of the Nuremberg Trials, which was originally taken uh, actually following Saturday, a week from yesterday on November 20th in 1945. So I'm gonna talk about the larger perspective of the Nuremberg Trials and uh, talk about that effort to provide justice after the Holocaust. And one more program to mention, uh, next Sunday, we are hosting a program about how the festival of Hanukkah was celebrated during the Holocaust. Our director of education, Dr. Avi Markovitz, will talk about his research into the traditions that were kept alive in the ghettos and concentration camps, and also the traditions that were followed in the DP camps, the displaced persons camps after the war. To learn more about any of those programs, you can go to our website at www.hmtcli.org and click on the events tab. Okay, with those announcements taken care of, let me stop sharing my screen and um, shift to tonight's program. I'd like to introduce the man who is behind our Sunday with Survivor program, and that is Michael Mantell. Michael is a 3G who reached out to us about a year ago to say, could he arrange a program with a survivor, a virtual program for a survivor to speak to his family? And we did that program and we did a couple more. And then we said, why are we only doing this for the Mantels? And so we turned that program and thankfully Michael and his family were eager to support this to, uh, to say that we should make this a public program series. And, and thus our Sunday with Survivor program was started. Uh, I'm grateful for Michael and the rest of his family's continuing support of the Holocaust Memorial and Tolerance Center and these program this evenings, and am delighted to turn it over to Michael to introduce more about the program and Anita Weisbord. Michael? Thank you so much, Thorin, and thank you to everyone at the Holocaust Memorial and Tolerance Center for making events like Sundays with Survivors possible. Thank you to everyone joining us tonight, and thank you to all of the survivors, especially Anita Weisbord. Welcome to Sundays with Survivors, a virtual program that allows Holocaust survivors the opportunity to share their testimonies with people all over the world. After our talk, we will share a link to the recording which will be available on YouTube so that you can rewatch and share Anita's testimony so that we can all do our part to keep our survivors' testimonies alive. Also, I am so excited to say that we will be starting our 2G Tuesdays program beginning Tuesday, November 30th, with our first guest speaker, Fred Gross. 2G Tuesdays is a program that will give children of Holocaust survivors the opportunity to share their parents' testimonies with us in the same virtual format. Today, Anita Weisbord will share with us her pre-war life in Vienna, her travels on the kinder transport, and her life after the war. At the end of the program, we'd love if you'd be able to ask your questions to Anita. And if you know how, you can use the raise hand feature, or if you prefer, you can write your questions or comments in the chat, 
and Thorne and I will read those as well. Uh, in the meantime, I'm going to ask everyone if they don't mind just uh, muting themselves. Uh, and with that, I'd like to thank you all for being here and uh, thank and welcome Anita Weisborg. Good evening. I was born in Vienna, Austria. I had a wonderful childhood. I had everything a child did. Loving parents, a brother, sister, a lot of aunts and uncles and cousins and friends. And Vienna is a beautiful city. Went on vacations, that's a school outing. And that was the last picture I took before I left. And I had whatever a child needs, love and contentment, and I loved my life. Until the day Hitler marched into Austria, that was March the 13th, 1938. Well, the Austrian claimed that they were the victims. Let me tell you, there were no victims. As you can see, they had the swastika flags already and people, the police had to hold the people back for when Hitler came in his open car into Vienna. There was marching on the street and chanting, Hitler awake, Jude awake. That means Hitler awake, Jews perish. That was the end of my childhood the way I knew it. This is the big Heldenplatz where they had the big rallies and the Austrian just welcomed them with open arms. And everything changed. You know, Jews had lived in Austria for hundreds of years. They were pillars of the community. They lived wonderful lives. But overnight, it all changed. In Germany, Hitler was already in power for a few years. So every year, another law came out. You couldn't go to school. You couldn't go to a movie. You couldn't even sit on the bench in the park. In Austria, within 24 hours, everything was in place. This is the university where they stopped Jewish students to come in. My cousin was a medical student, but he couldn't continue his studies. He was not allowed to enter the university. And they put signs on Jewish stores, don't buy to, by Jews. They had the SS standing outside the store to be sure that nobody goes in into the store. It was, Unbelievable how everything changed. Like I had a girlfriend living next door. We went to school together. She was Catholic and I was Jewish. There was never any different. I used to be in her house decorating the Christmas tree. She loved to come to our house, Passover, having matzo ball soup. There was never any different. But after the Anschluss, she was afraid to talk to me because she was afraid if somebody see her being together with me, they could announce her and she would be arrested. So everything was so impossible. You were afraid if you leave your house, if you come back. And just before Hitler marched in, there was a plebiscite and they had political signs on the street corners, on the street, and they made the Jews to scrub the floors. You can see how the people, even children, watching them, spitting at them, and make them less than human. It was a terrible time. And of course, then came Christmas night, November the 9th and 10th the night of the broken glass. They burned all synagogues in Vienna except one. The one they couldn't burn because it was in a very small street and attached to houses. They were afraid if they burned it, the whole block would go up. But they used that synagogue 
as a stable for their horses. They came into our home, arrested my father, who ended up in Dachau concentration camp, smashed some furnishes, beat my mother and took whatever they want. Now you would think you called the police. You couldn't, they were one of them. There was absolutely nothing you could do. You just hope that you stay alive. My sister and I were hiding in the corner. We were so afraid that they're going to harm my mother. This is a picture of Dachau. That's when the people arrived. They had thousands of boys and men were arrested that day. And they usually went to Dachau and Buchenwald concentration camp. And the other picture shows this like a very thin uniform. And remember, it was wintertime, November, December, and there was no heat. A lot of them died in the concentration camp from mistreatment and, and hunger. My brother, who was already in his early 20s, his so-called friends were going to come for him. So he went illegally to France, he went to Paris. Now, in Europe, you needed identity papers. Of course, he had none. So the French police stopped him. As he had no papers, they were going to send him back. So he joined the French Foreign Legion and ended up in Africa. You see the picture of him in the Foreign Legion uniform. And when the British during the war came to North Africa, he joined the British Army. And the other picture shows him as a British soldier. My mother knew that she had to run from place to place. She has to save her children. She knew that was important because right after Christmas, Hitler waited. How will the world react? to what he did. The world was quiet. So Hitler knew he can do what he wants to do and he surely did it. But there was one country who had some compassion. Right after Christmas, they had a debate in part, that was England. Right after Christmas, they had a debate in parliament. What could they do? they decided to take in an unspecified number of children. They had to be under 17 years of age and come alone. That was called the Tinder transport. I remember my aunt who had four children having a violent argument with my mother. My aunt called my mother a rotten mother. How can you send your children away? How can you do that? You know, until I became a mother, did I realize they are both right. What does a mother want to do? Hold your clothes. That's what mothers do. But I truly believe my mother gave birth to me twice. When I was born and when she had the strength and the foresight to send me and the Tinder transport. I don't remember how many children were there. Now, when I speak to students, I usually to ask them to just visualize for a minute what it would be like to leave their country they are born, go to a foreign country, you don't know the language. You don't know who's going to take care of you and you leave your parents and loved ones behind. You know, today with social media, television, internet, you know what happens in the world instantly. We didn't have that. I had no idea where England was. I never met an English person. As far as I'm concerned, England could have been in outer space. So it was a scary idea. 
I remember the day I left was March 13, 1939. I only remember the date because it was the one year anniversary of Hitler marching into Austria. They were marching on the streets and they were celebrating. The day we were inside the train, the windows tightly closed. I'm inside my mother outside. For four agonizing hours, that train stood there. I'm inside my mother outside. I was afraid to step away from the window. I was afraid I would lose her forever. That's over 80 years ago. And to this day, I cannot stand anybody seeing me off. It left that impression on me. I don't remember how many children were on the trip, but there were little ones, two-year-olds and three-year-olds who had no idea what happened to them. They just cried for their mothers. And if some, fa some family members survived and came for them, they couldn't even remember them because they were too young. This is an uh, ad Lord Balfour put into the London Times to collect money to help the children to settle, resettle them. Within 24 hours, they collected 50,000 pounds, which was a lot of money at that time. Between December, the first transport arrived in England until August, just before war broke out in 10 months, 10,000 children were saved. 90% of all those children never saw their parents again. Now this is a list we have to give to the Gestapo. We were only allowed to take a small suitcase, only personal belongings. We were not allowed to take anything of value. This is a letter my father wrote to me when he heard I was leaving for England, where he wishes me Godspeed. And I should always remember what my parents tried to teach me, and he gave me his blessings. I cherish that letter. This is how we traveled from Vienna through Germany, and we came to the border. When we came to the border, Nazis came into a train, opened suitcases, threw them out, and said, anybody who smuggled anything back, you go. But nothing happened. And then we went over to Holland, and we felt free. And there were ladies on the platform that gave us hot chocolate and, and sandwiches. This is a statue in Vienna at the railway station where all the trains left. And the other one is in Liverpool Station in London, where all the children arrived. This is a picture of the first transport arriving in England. Most children had wonderful experiences. Some children were exploited, but at least we were free. We always worried what happens to the one we left behind. This is the lady who took me in, Mrs. Butcher. This is the identity card, and this is, we had to go to the police whenever we moved or changed because we were called as enemy aliens. Of course, then war broke out. At that time, we had no more communication with any family members. And then we had the blitz, the bombing, 
this is a picture of the underground. The underground in London is very deep. So people could sleep there. We all had to do war work. And I worked in a factory to making wings for airplanes. Now the people who took in the children were responsible for them until they're 18 years of age. And I don't remember how long it took me to learn English, but it was such a culture shock. Everything was different. The food was terrible. You know, when you're a teenager, you're very fussy. And we had high tea, these tiny little sandwiches. I remember I used to hold my hand under the table. I could have taken the whole plate and eat it. But I had to be in my best behavior because I was afraid they might send me back. After I went to London, as I said, I had to find life. But of course, during the war, we had no communication. We had no idea whatever happened to our. That was some more the flying bombs which came. Well, I got married in England. That's a Russian book we had to have, but it's strict fashioning. That's my brother and sister. We went to Vienna, where I call a trip to my childhood. I have four, two children, four granddaughters, and I was invited back in Vienna to speak to school children in Vienna. There I spoke to a high school. You know, when you speak to students, I always tell them, we tell you the story of the Holocaust to show you where, lead, where hate can lead to. Not to be bystanders. If more people would have spoken up, it might not have happened. I know I didn't go through the horror of the camps, but any child, who is torn away from the life and the family they knew and have to move to a foreign country. It was not easy. My sister, who was already in teens, she was too old to go on the finger transport. But England took in people if they needed their skills. They needed maids. So she came as a domestic. Believe me, at home she didn't go down thing. But you do what you do to survive. As I said, I always tell the students that never to forget what happened to children. It should never should happen again. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing this the testimony, Anita. Really amazing. Um, I want to um, give people a moment to gather their questions. I'm sure there's a lot of questions and comments that people um, want to uh, ask. I wanted to uh, first ask you, you mentioned that your sister also came over to England, um, but not as uh, not part of the kinder transport because she was older. Um, do you know when? she came to England and how that was arranged exactly? Well, England needed people, they needed maids, so she could apply for that and she came as a maid. And also you mentioned um, that uh, people who took in children, um, they did to up to the age of 18, yes. correct? So um, for you, what was, what was that like? Uh, I'm not sure exactly how old you were when you were um, with this woman. Uh, what was that like for you? Uh, well, uh, and the people were supposed to send the children to school, but she didn't send me to school. She wanted me as a, as a companion. And she was very kind, very good to me, but was very lonely. And 
as I said, when I was 18, I went to London where I had an aunt and my sister. I had to find a job and make a life for myself. Anita, if I could follow up with one other question as well. <clears throat> I know you said that your father was arrested yeah. and taken to Dachau. I know. Well, at that time, Jews could come out of the concentration camp. Mm. The final solution came later in 41. As long as you have somewhere to go. My mother purchased a ticket to Shanghai. He couldn't go to Shanghai with it, but it was enough to show the Gestapo he had somewhere to go. So he came home, but he had to leave Vienna within two weeks. So he went to Budapest in Hungary because they had family there, so he could live somewhere. And when the war was over, and all the lists came out. The Germans were very sorrow of having this when the people were deported, when they died and where they died. And the Red Cross and the uh, Jewish communities had the lists and people went to look for names. And I couldn't find the name. It took four months till we heard, don't forget, when all the newsreels came out of the, the British and the American uh, coming into the camps and, and liberate the camps. And we saw all those dead bodies. I thought it could be my parents. We had had no idea what happened to them. It took four months, we got a letter from the Red Cross. I was afraid to open it because it means I had a dead better life. They went through hell, but they survived. Now, Hungary was one of the last countries Hitler invaded. At that time, the Jews knew about Auschwitz. They knew if you go to the railway station, that means certain deaths in Auschwitz. My mother was picked up to go on the column to march to the railway station. She knew, well, that's the end of me. She saw a ditch. She said, well, if they see me, they shoot me. So she jumped, nobody saw her. She had that strength. She has to see her children again. Wow. Um, I know that there are some other questions that have come in. I, I see that Frank Miller has a question. Frank, would you like to pose it uh, orally? Do you want to just unmute and, and pose your question? Sure. <clears throat> Anita, thank you so much for your wonderful presentation. I've heard you uh, a few times in the past. Every time I listen to you, I'm moved and inspired and, and learn even more. Um, as you know, my mother was on the first kinder transport from Vienna, so this is a particular area of interest for me. Uh, I love your perspective and I love the way you express it. Uh, my question is this, Anita, when you went back to Vienna, uh, could you talk a little bit about what that felt like for you? Um, and also what it was like uh, when you spoke to the student groups there? Um. Well, the first time when I went was in the 80s, when I went with my brother and sister. Uh, we happened to come to England, and just the three of us went for four days, and I called it the trip to my childhood. It, it was like a love and hate relationship. I remember the good times, but then, of course, the bad times took over. I'll give you an example. We were in the stop park. It's like a big park set on the bench. And I saw some writing on the bench. I jumped up like crazy because I remember saying Jews are not allowed. All it said, it's property of state of Vienna. I mean, nowhere else would I have that feeling than just in Vienna. All the bad memories came back. And 
speaking to the high school kids, that was a very good experience because they had a special day and the big Heldenplatz where they used to have the big Nazi rallies, they had a special program about against hate. And I remember one of the school kids wore a t-shirt with a swastika and a fist going through. So it's the third generation already. Hopefully that they will make a difference. Um, Anita, I, I believe I've heard in the past when you've spoken about your childhood friend and you mentioned her briefly earlier on and, and Yes, I think I, I did mention it to Mitzi who lives next door. I told you that we were good friends and she was afraid after Hitler marched in, she was afraid to talk to me because if somebody see her, see us together, they could announce and she would be, she would be um, arrested. But it was very funny. She had to put a swastika on her bicycle and she had no sewing machine. So she came to our house to sew the swastika for her bicycle on our sewing machine. But she didn't afraid to say anything because you never know how people can turn on you. So your family sewing machine was used to make the swastika yeah. for play. Yes. I was sewing machine to sew the swastika play. Wow. Um, other than, when, can you share any more of your memories from your childhood in Vienna? And what changed other than your friendship with her clearly, but were there other ways in which you were made to feel different in of Vienna? Of course felt different because you know we are ostracized. You were afraid to walk the streets. If I saw somebody in uniform, I tried to go to the other side. You were always afraid because people disappeared. People were just taken away from the street. So you never know when you leave your house if you come back. It was a very scary time. And that's why my mother was so forceful, she has to say for children. I told you my aunt who argued with my mother and wouldn't let her children go. They all perished. So it's the strength of my mother really that I'm alive today. Well, um, thank you, Anita. Uh, we have two follow-up questions, one from Greta and then one from uh, Diane. Uh, so Greta, if you wanna uh, unmute yourself, uh, you can ask that first. Yep. Um, I was wondering when you said that, I think you said that parents couldn't really communicate with their kids who came to England via the kinder transport. I was wondering like, does that mean they also weren't able to like send them letters somehow? I realize it might take a while to get there, but were they able to send letters to their kids? Well, we could only have correspondence until war broke out. Once war broke out, everything stopped. You couldn't get any communication. So we had no idea what happened to my parents. So that's from 1939 until 1945. Yeah. Yeah. And as I said, when the newsreels came out from the liberation of the camps and we saw all those dead bodies, I had, could be my parents. I mean, I remember I had sleepless nights. I had nightmares, not knowing. And I couldn't find them on any list until we finally got a letter from the Red Cross. They went to hell, but my father was beaten, was left for dead, but they survived. Well, uh, Diane has a perfect follow-up question to that. Thank you so much for your share. I'm so moved by it. And my follow-up question is, were you reunited with your parents? Yes, we, uh, we got them to England. Um, the difficult, it was not difficult to get a permit to get them to England 
But the difficulty was the Russians liberated Hungary and they didn't want people to leave. So we sent cigarettes and coffee. And with cigarettes and coffee, they could bribe their way to get an access visa and we got them to England. That's strong coffee. Amazing. <laughs> yeah. Um, if anyone else has any questions, you're you know, welcome to. It's so funny that nobody talks about it. I mean, I never asked my mother. I was lucky to see her again. And I never asked her, how did you get me on the kinder transport? How did that happen? How did you feel at the railway station when you say goodbye to me? Never asked. We never talked about it. And it took survivors a long time until we could talk about our experiences. And I think it's important for the new generation to know what can happen if they let hate to go forward. Anita, later on, you also, you never spoke to your, your mother about that, that experience of, of when you were departing? No. It must have been painful for both of you. No. And uh, I remember one day I was thinking, one and a half million children perished in the Holocaust, and I'm alive. There have to be a reason. And I really felt very strongly that I have to give something back to society. And when my children went to school full time, I started to volunteer with handicapped children and other things, and I'm still doing it, because I really felt I have to give back, because there have to be a reason I'm alive and then one and a half million children perish. Anita, can I ask you to talk about that, that experience of being in England as a child? You were a teenager when you got to England, is that right? So what, and you didn't know the language? No. I don't remember how long it took me to learn the language. But did you feel ostracized in England? Did you feel welcomed? Did you feel safe? Yes, well, the people were very kind, very, I felt safe, definitely. Felt very safe. I didn't feel any, uh, the, I know a lot of them would say, you like it here, when are you going back? But look, they took 20,000 children. I mean, every week some more children came. They had to open holiday camps to house the children. And every weekend people came to, to take a child, to take them into their home. And they really opened their home and their hearts for those children. And did you feel that at the time? Did you feel at the time that that uh, the English were were doing something special and were safeguarding you? Yes, I do. Look, I don't know if the people are aware that here in America, um, Senator Wagner and Congresswoman Rogers proposed a bill to Parliament to to. Congress to bring in 20,000 children. It never came to the floor of the Senate. It was killed in committee. Yes. It never happened. So England was definitely, did a lot more than what America did at the time. Yes. Yeah. Could have done more. Um, just in following up with the family that you stayed with in England, the Butchers or Mrs. Butcher. Oh. Did, what kind of, I mean, were, did you stay in touch with her after your family, at the end of the war, after your family arrived and after you, you returned to be with your family? What was that relationship like after? Well, I stayed in contact with her, but she was an elderly lady. She wasn't alive anymore by the end of the war. So oh. I wish I could have 
told her, but um, her son was a member of parliament and my aunt came there as a cook and uh, they arranged and that his mother arranged for me to come. Okay. Michael, are there other questions that you wanna handle? Yeah, um, we have a great question from Michelle. Michelle, um, do you feel comfortable unmuting yourself and asking the question? Give you a moment, otherwise I can ask the question for you. All right, I'll go ahead and ask the question. Um, Michelle asked, uh, what did you do um, to, to fill your time when you had some spare time as a child in England? Uh, I really don't remember some of the young people. And another thing is that the Mrs. Butcher who took me in didn't only take me in to save my life, she wanted to save my soul. I should accept Jesus Christ as my Savior. I went to church twice on Sunday and people were extremely kind, but she never forced anything on me. She accepted the way, you know, if I would have been younger, and not come from a traditional Jewish home, it would have been so easy. A new country, a new language, why not a new religion? But I was 15, I was old enough to know who I was. I'm so glad you brought that up, that's so important. Um, <laughs> but she, she knew you were Jewish, Mrs. Butcher did. Yes, of and course she did. And continued to, to take you to church yeah. and hope that you would she, yeah, but she was a very kind woman. She did it out of her heart. Yeah. I mean, she was very devoted to her religion. And I explained to her, so I meant to mine, and she accepted it. But getting to Michelle's question, you said you worked, right? I mean, you weren't like a little child. You were a teenager, and then you worked while you were in England. Is that right? Yeah. And you worked in the in the in a factory, you said, making, making yes, airplane yeah. wings and stuff. Well, during the war, I worked in a... It used to be a Rolls Royce company, and of course they had to do war work, and we made wings for airplanes. And but when you're, watched, I remember watching the dog fights, the the RF, the British, and the German Spitfires having dog fights right over London. And then, of course, when the rockets came, that was very scary. And I think Michelle's question was like, so did you socialize with other of the women working, other girls who were working at the factory? Did yeah, you make yeah. other friends? Once I was in London, somehow we did not really have a lot of time with English people. We sort of kept together. The refugees sort of kept together. They had an Austrian club, they had a Czech club. So people tried to we all felt we're in the same boat. And it was a happy time because we all were the same. Nobody had any money, but we tried to, to do what we can. I remember in the summer for two weeks, the ranch to be on a farm because the men were all called up. So they needed workers at harvest time. And we went there. We slept in tents and it was like a free vacation, just worked a few hours and it was a lot of fun. So we tried to make the life as easy, but always in the back of us, everybody worried what happened to the parents. As I said, 90% of all these children never saw their parents again. And there are two there's a guilt of survival. When all the lists came out and I met friends on the street, they tell me Ravensburg, Baba Yar, or Auschwitz. And I felt guilty to tell them mine survived. It's a very funny feeling. Yeah. Um, 
can you tell us a little about how you met your husband? And at the party, I met him at a party. As I said, we tried to stay together and try to make our life as good as we can do it. And I met him at the party. And my husband was in the British Army. And when he came out, they made him an enemy alien. And he had to be home at a certain time. So he said, I'm not staying here, I'm going to America. We came to America in 1947. And I remember when my daughter became 15 years old, I looked at her and I said to myself, she doesn't know how lucky she is that she was born in this country. Where, where had your husband been? Where was he born originally? Yes, he came from Leipzig, Germany. And did he come on the on the kinder transport as well? No, no. He came, uh, his father was in the fur business. And as I said, English, England took in people who needed their skill and they had no fur industry. So they brought in people over who were in the fur industry. So his father came to London, left my, his children, my, my husband and his younger sister with an uncle, thinking he will get somebody to guarantee for the children, which he did. Eventually, they followed him to London, to England. And I'm wondering also about the, what you said, you came to America in 1947, so that's very quickly after the war as well. Were yeah. things notably different in America, did you find, than in England? Of course, the don't forget we had such strong passion. We had one egg a week. We had hardly, really, very little. When I came to America, I gained 10 pounds with all the food. Yeah, it was another difference, but his sister was in America. She was a GI bride. So we first stayed with them and then we went to New York. And what about the, in terms of the reaction from Americans compared to Englishmen or English people for refugees? Was there a, a difference? No, no, I find uh, the American people did make any difference. I've never found any, any, anything. The contrary. And I'm going to jump ahead. You talked about, and Michael asked you about speaking to the Viennese high school students when yeah. you went. But I know you also give a number of talks to American high school students. Yeah. And I'm wondering about if there's a notable difference in the reactions you think about that you've gotten from American students versus those from Vienna. No, I remember once a high school girl started to cry bitterly, and I got very upset. And she said, I can't imagine leaving my mother. So at least I reached her. She could sympathize what it would mean. Yeah, maybe a very different, um, a different juxtaposition for a Viennese, for an Austrian high school yeah. student to think their families were likely perpetrators. Yeah. versus Americans, American high school students who think of their, their families, if there was any connection, it would be as a liberator or somebody who served in the army. So a very different, different placement in their mind of what this story means. Well, I tell the students as well, if they ever hear somebody tell them the Holocaust never happened, you better tell them you're hurt from survivors. You know that it happened. For sure. For sure. Um, I think our time is uh, almost coming to an end, and so I want to pass it to Michael for any last comments or thoughts before we close our session. Michael, uh, just uh, thank you so much for for doing this. Um, this is literally the eighty third anniversary uh, of uh, commemoration of Kristallnacht. So to have this this month is is very important, and to know. Um, that all of the survivors and all of the uh, victims of the Holocaust are remembered. 
So I just appreciate everyone for being here. Thank you to the Holocaust Memorial and Tolerance Center for the incredible work and for helping to support programs like Sundays with Survivors. And thank you so much, Anita, for your time tonight. That is all mine. Thank you, Anita. Thank you. You're wonderful. Thank, thank you, everybody. <laughs> Have a good evening, and I hope for yeah. seeing you again soon. But thank you for joining us this evening. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you.